I like can look back now, thankfully, with my two children and say it was a horrendously difficult period of my life, but I came out of it with an amazing family. And I think when you're going through it, you don't know that that's going to be the case and it can feel really lonely and really isolating. Careers, motherhood, promotions, and then some. Introducing CEO of OMD UK, Laura Fenton. I want to be the CEO of this business one day. That would be the best fun ever to have that job. And he used to have clients going in and out of his office. He'd do the big company meetings and stand up and be really inspirational to people. I remember saying to him, I want your job. And he will always say it still to me now, like, wow. But of all the points in my career, that was the moment I had the biggest wobble. To be clear with your intentions can help you better your position. Even if it's telling the CEO you want their job, now that's some bold ambition. I love that. I can't believe you can just write that lie about what someone's saying to you. That's amazing. That's the easy bit in a way to go, I want to be a millionaire. I'm not a millionaire, by the way, that's for the record. <laughs> you know, and it's not about that. It's about, okay, set your goal and then what do you do about it? And you consistently over the years, over the years has had this focus of getting to your goal and you'll prove that you can get there. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. Hi, I'm Laura Fenton and this is how I became CEO of OMD UK. One of four siblings, so from young, our guest learned how to get noticed. She attended an experimental secondary school with unconventional rules and despite the chaos, achieved well and kept focused. With a father coming from humble beginnings, to reach where she is, some could seem it improbable. It could be that she listened and took his advice, that if you focus enough, anything is possible. A cornerstone of OMD, with a career there that spans over two decades. Soon we'll hear about her ups and downs, triumphs and overcoming blockades. Careers, motherhood, promotions, and then some. Introducing CEO of OMD UK, Laura Fenton. Thank you so much. Welcome. I'm not sure anyone's ever written a poem for me before. Well, today you'll get not one, but two. It's amazing. We'll have one Worth at the, the end trip. too. So your life, we've, we've split it into five chapters that we'll go through today in telling the story of how you became CEO of OMD UK. Chapter one, as Ash mentioned, going to an experimental school and early life, influence of parents. Chapter two, 16 years is the number of years in the same organization going from a graduate role to CEO. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And your sort of unique ambitions with that, which we'll talk about. Chapter three, family life. You've got two lovely children. Mm -hmm. You've also experienced two miscarriages and talking about your reflections on how to deal with that and maybe, yeah, reflections on how not to deal with that. And chapter four, how you learned the value of life itself. Chapter five, how to run a successful business and unpacking what goes on in the mind and the, and the planning of Laura Fenton as a CEO. Sounds great. There we go. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. <laughs> Tell us, we'll start with an introduction about OMD. Yeah. For anybody who doesn't know about OMD, maybe not in advertising and media, could you explain who they are, what they do? I'd love to. Um, so OMD is a media planning and buying agency. So we work with a bunch of really amazing clients and our job is to advise them on how to best invest their money into marketing, but primarily kind of media investments. So which channels, which audiences, how, where, when, and then make sure that all of that media investment is working as hard as it possibly can to deliver their objectives and we're talking big clients here yeah british gas we've got british gas mcdonald's barclays pepsico compare the market just to name a few so yeah we've got some pretty big amazing clients and burberry's another one you burberry's won recently. one of our newest ones yeah yeah so we have a full spectrum we kind of we kind of do a bit of everything all audiences all categories so yeah, we feel we're very lucky to work with um, the clients that we work with. And, you know, winning multiple awards and some of the biggest, most prestigious awards, Can Lions, for years and years doing very well there. Yeah. Um, I like to read out some stats. 
ad age estimated in terms of globally OMD revenues of all, almost $1.3 billion in 2020. Network across the world covers more than 100 countries and uh, number of staff, 963. Is that globally? That well, That's in the UK. UK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So they're on, that's under your remit. Well, so we, we have, it's, um, we have a sister agency set up. So we've got Manning Gottlieb OMD um, and then we've got OMD UK. So it kind of roughly splits down the middle and then I look up to the OMD UK part of it. Brilliant. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's the short story of OMD. Now for the story of how you became the CEO of this organization in the UK. Uh, early life. Yeah. Where, where does your story begin? So... Um, it's really helpful that you've done my chapter set up because it'll keep me on point with like what we're talking about. Um, but I think, yeah, if I go right back to my childhood, which is where you like start on these podcasts, isn't it? Um, I um, grew up in Leamington Spa. Um, I was, as you mentioned, um, I come from a big family. I'm the third of four children. Um, and I definitely think that in itself probably really started to kind of shape the foundations of who I am now and you know the the role that I ended up doing I think I any know. anyone who comes from a big family I think you know um that really if you're going to be heard or noticed you've got to either be doing something special or kind of speak pretty loudly to make your voice heard so noise yeah make some noise do something yeah exactly oh oh look she's she's there this one she's got something to say oh, yeah we've got four yeah one two three four um, so I think that there's no, like, I, I'm very lucky that I come from, I had a like amazing childhood, a very lovely, loving family. And like me and my brothers and my sister were, you know, best mates. I'm sure we were at each other's throats half the time as well. But I think, I think there definitely was something in that, that it teaches you from a very young age to stand on your own two feet and look after yourself. Like I say, speak up for yourself and, and really know that you're not, the world doesn't revolve around you. Um, I think was probably a learning quite early on. Tell us about your parents, because you say that you are, you're basically half of both of them. Yes, I'd say so. And so to get to know you, we need to get to know them. And you're, you're, let's start with your father. He's got an interesting story. Yeah, so my dad um, came from a very poor working class background. He was one of eight children. Um, and he was the only child of his family who kind of, I guess, um, got themselves like a professional job. Um, so he managed to somehow, and I still don't think he really knows exactly how, he managed to get himself an apprenticeship, um, an engineering apprenticeship actually it was in the first place. And so he was the only one who managed to get himself out of this very poor kind of working class background. He was the only one to um, leave Stroud, which was where him and his family grew up. And he got this engineering apprenticeship, worked super, super hard at it. And then actually the way that him and my mum managed to buy their first house is um he won the pools um so that was how he managed to buy his first house so he'd managed like he i guess he struck lucky i mean three times really because he also met my mom so he like managed to get this apprenticeship um to study for and en study engineering um he met my mom and then he won the pools and just cool, explain what yeah. the pools are the pool are... do you know what i still feel like i'm of the generation where i'm not quite sure what it is it's like it was like the lottery of back then so you would like buy a ticket and i think he won like fifteen thousand pounds or something which i guess is the equivalent of a couple of hundred grand now i guess yeah. and it was enough that they managed to buy the deposit on their first home oh great um so yeah he he definitely kind of um struck lucky there but my dad i think because he came from a this this you know poor working class background has he is the hardest worker I know he has got the most incredible work ethic and that definitely he definitely did his best to instill that into all of us I say that because I'm not always sure um all of us all took it up all the time but you know it was that thing that we all we all recognized we could see him he used to leave the house in the morning before any of us were awake and you know he'd be back super late and you know he definitely like demonstrated to us that like mm -hmm. you know that work ethic is really important but also I think more than that he definitely taught us all and he would talk about it a lot that like you can really achieve anything that you put your mind to if you focus on something and you want it enough and you're willing to work hard enough for it like anything is possible and I think some of that he would have instilled in us through words but a lot of that would have been instilled in us through 
behaviors and like yeah. literally this kind of role modeling like demonstration of like look at what's possible like mm. you know you can you know climb the ladder you can create a new path for your life for your family if you if you work hard enough and you've got the right focus so I think and he th my dad's always been hugely ambitious for all of us as well um and when I think about actually when I think about gender stereotyping and stuff like that he definitely never treated me my sister my brothers any differently he just had super high hopes for all of us and wanted all of us to achieve equally um so I think you know there's probably something in that um like the equality side of it, actually as well that he you know from a very young age it was just like we were all the same he wanted us all to go forth and do you know as as well as we could possibly do in the world I see he wasn't sort of yeah already stereotyping okay the boys are going to go and do this kind of world and the girls are going to do this no no it was like kind of for all of us so and with that like I guess came some pretty high expectations but we always have this I always tell this story about my dad that every um parents evening he would go with his time manager and like speak to our teachers and then um he would go through it and he would highlight in his highlighter pen the bad comments anything negative and specifically in a different highlighter color any comment that had come up year on year wow and then this was like from primary school age right we'd he'd get home he'd sit down with us we'd ha he'd have a meeting with each of us on the sofa Love and he'd that. open his time manager and all we were trying to do was like look over the top to see how much highlighter pen there was because that was like meant bad yeah. um so it was really funny like i i honestly think he's probably still got those notes somewhere because it was like you know he'd literally be flicking through and be like well i think you'll find that two terms ago uh laura your teacher was also saying you get all your work done and distract other people which was my like my regular cons <laughs> do you use the highlighter pens now and do you have a funny relationship with no, you like wow. no i'm not a big highlighter pen fan if i'm honest i can no, understand I why our system like if something's important i put a little star on it so okay there's got to be something in that surely <laughs> yeah. it's pretty cool yeah uh, you mentioned your school yeah, tell us a bit more about this school. I, it sounds so fascinating when you shared it with us uh, yeah. a couple of days ago. Yeah, do you know, it's one of those things. It's, you know when like you're, it's only when you, sometimes you get a bit older and you look back at a period of your life that you realise it might have not been like typical. So yeah, I went to a school, um, I think I did describe it as a social experiment, but it was definitely like very atypical. It was, um, the, I guess the ethos behind the school was it, it was designed to try and get the children to stand on their own two feet, um, kind of find their own like kind of worth ethic and set their own like targets and standards. So um, there was quite a lot that went with it. So we, we called our teachers by their first name. There was no uniform. There was no homework. There was no detention. I remember the math system. It was like you went and got your own, like chose your own topic out of the filing cabinet did it and then marked it yourself using the book there was no like at the front of the sounds like paradise i mean it was right. quite good yeah. <laughs> you could get full marks every time without doing until the exams came around and then oh <laughs> <laughs> um but it was yeah it was quite interesting in the um like it definitely worked better for like i guess different types of people i'm not yeah. i mean this social experiment is no longer like the, the school still exists but it's um it's i guess it's more of a typical school now mm -hmm. i think they abandoned that that ethos um but I think what it did give is it definitely gave you the opportunity to stand on your own feet two feet like when I went to university I didn't find it difficult to you know some people have that moment at university where suddenly all the structure goes and they're like oh my god they go off the rails and you know fail bomb out or like don't do very well like definitely by the time I got to university I was like no it's cool like I can I know how to motivate myself I know how to manage my own workload all that kind of stuff so yeah, it was it was it was quite different. Like I've never worn a school uniform at any school I've ever been to, and you know you think now I realise that's, you know, slightly unusual. I remember getting a waitressing job where I was required to wear a tie, and I had absolutely no idea how to do up a tie. I had to get someone to show me how to do it. So it's just like, um, yeah. So it was yeah. So I'd say that was that's probably shaped me in lots of ways as well because I think you think like you know I came from a like a big fa big family background then I went to this school where a lot of it was about like kind of self self motivation and um yeah setting your own goals really yeah, you pretty much through your whole yeah childhood and and school life have had to work thing work things out for yourself or kind of yeah work a way to get your success in your own sort of steam and, and yeah strategies yeah I think so and um like I think my mum and dad were very careful also to not um, 
hand stuff to us on a plate. So yeah. I didn't actually learn to drive till I was 30 because my mum and dad didn't pay for us all to have driving lessons. And at the time there were other things I wanted to like spend my hard earned money on. But all of us had jobs, like whether it's paper rounds, I used to work sometimes going to help out in the local corner shop. I used to clean our next door neighbor's hairdresser's floor when I was like 13, 14 to get some money at the weekends. Because my mum and dad basically just didn't give us like loads of spending money. They were like, if you if you want to learn to drive or go out the weekends or do what you need to go and earn the money to go and do it. So I think that was probably like going back to that kind of work ethic point. I think yeah. it was all very clear. And if you didn't do it, like you, you, you weren't going to get. What did you spend your money on? Not driving lessons. I think I probably spent my money on like beer and clothes mm. and socializing. Yeah. Socializing. Yeah. I was like, yeah. yeah, I don't feel like I want to prioritize driving lessons at this moment in my life. <laughs> I think there was probably a big push for all of us to be self reliant from very early doors. And I think even now, like, like when I think about us all as like adults, like my mum and dad are very much they're incredibly loving and supportive, and they'll do anything from a like a time host host perspective they they would never come in and step in and like try and financially support anyone because for them that's like that would break all of the all the rules and all of that groundwork that they laid they're like no no you guys need to stand on your own two feet and go and like win it for yourselves let's talk about the other half of you then your your mother yes how how would you describe her and, and what traits have you sort of uh do you see in yourself today um so my mom is like she's amazing she's i'd say she's very very different from my dad like she's not um got an like a, from a career perspective anyway she's not got an ambitious bone in her body in that sense she was a very very good primary school teacher she's actually a primary school teacher at the school we all went to um but really her her like you know her i guess her mission in life has been around family and home she was definitely the homemaker our house when I was growing up was the house that like everyone came to it was always full of people full of friends like my mum's always she's an amazing cook so there was always something cooking like she always everything that she cooks almost could always just feed loads of people everything's in a massive pot like nothing you know fancy but she's still like that now like you know whenever she you know whenever it's my birthday I'll quite often like go actually we're gonna go to my mum and dad's house and everyone's really happy about it because my mum will cook some ginormous massive pot of food and so I think she, like her, she's very much um, like a home maker um, and, you know, created this like amazing like heart, like heart for all of our like family life, I suppose. So I think definitely I've also adopted loads of that in who I've become now. And again, when I think about my siblings, I think all of us are actually pretty similar. All of us are like love to host, love to have people around. We've all got like really strong, like our own strong like families networks that we've built um and that's definitely the bit that i've kind of got from my mum mm. yeah so they're they're very di and i think in the way i grew up they probably almost had they were probably two halves of a whole yeah I, my you know obviously they you know my dad was a very important part of our family but he he was the main breadwinner he was going out there and earning the money um and my mum was like the homemaker even mm. though she also had a job so you know i think that whereas i guess what when I think about what I'm going on to do, because I really, I do very much have like both of them, their, I guess their legacy in, in who I am now. And I think for me it is, it has been about how, how do I reconcile those two halves of myself when it's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's not, we're not dividing, like my family, me and my husband both have full-time jobs and we're both trying to blend it all together. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I guess it's trying to work that out. I think people will, as they hear your story, they'll see how these two parts have manifested in, in the way that you've approached certain times of your life and opportunities and work yeah. and life. So we will we will see that later in this in this story. Well, yeah, where did you go from here? So you finished secondary school. Where do you go on from here? So I went to university. I went to Leeds. Great place to go to university. I studied... Cool uni. Yeah, it's really cool uni. Mm. I did. I think I a lot of the reason I went there it was good for languages, and also I went to look around on a really sunny day. There were just loads of people having loads of fun, sitting out on the grass, like reading books, drinking beer, and stuff. And I was like, this just got. It had a really good vibe. Um, so I went to university there, um, and I did languages. One of the reasons because I I I love languages, but also because I was really interested to pick a degree where I could live abroad for a year. Um, so I lived in France for a year as part of my degree. Um. Yeah, and I loved I loved university. I had a great time. I learned loads. Yeah, I learned to speak French, so that was good. Mm -hmm. Got to spend my year in France. 
Leeds, yeah, Leeds was a really cool city. And how does it lead to your first graduate role, which yeah. is really the path to becoming CEO, which is yeah. crazy. And mm -hmm. most stories don't have, have not started like this. The CEO bit comes a bit later. So I didn't know whether I'd make a very good podcast guest because it's quite linear. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I mean, to go from an organization 16 years later and the same organization, you didn't leave really. No. At all. Mm -mm. Then to be CEO is cool. And there's another element which is quite cool, which we'll get to. Okay. Yeah. Like, where did this spark, this spark of uh, your love for media or your want to get into the media industry begin? So after university, I went um, traveling with my my best mate from school. I didn't I had no idea because I'd done languages. I didn't really, it was like, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do as a, a job. And so when we were traveling, everyone that we met, I just would talk to people and like ask them questions about like, you know, if the, especially people who had like had, were already like working, having a career break or whatever. I just would try and talk to different people about what they were doing. Um, and I remember meeting this guy, um, who I'm actually still in touch with now, who um, was telling me he'd done a uh, like a placement program, like a, a year at university um, working in advertising. And he was telling me about it and I was like, really interesting and he'd actually worked in a creative agency um but he was talking to me all about it and I was like well, that does actually sound really interesting so when I got back there were a few different things I think I was like reading around but I basically I remember going into WH Smith and buying a copy of campaign magazine oh, right. I thought right I'll have a flick through this and there was a, at the back there was all like, job adverts and there were a few for graduate jobs one of them was for Cara um yeah. one of them was for OMD and I think there was one, I think there was one at TBWA, which is an advertising agency. I remember applying for all three of them. I got a rejection letter from Cara within like about a week. Oh, no. But actually, I was quite upset about it. I thought, oh, this is maybe not going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry, for whatever reason, your CV's not great for us. And then I got an invitation to go and um, like to come into OMD. And I was like, definitely, this is great. And they did this whole graduate day. I literally, I can remember it as so clearly. And it was... We don't do it like this anymore. It was a bit like um, X Factor. So there were various rounds of it through the day and then they would split people into two rooms and then they'd go, right, you guys are through to the next round and then everyone else would just not come back. Oh. Right. It's really fun, yeah. quite cutthroat. I mean, it's fun if you're on the right side of it. <laughs> <laughs> you would be saying that now if they sent you home. At the I know. Well. I really remember there was one exercise where it was like, um, it was a big, like there were loads of us sitting around in our old office around the boardroom table. And it was about, they wanted us to discuss and debate, like what would you take into the desert in a survival situation? You've got to agree between you what three things you're going to take in. And I remember this one guy, he was a real loud mouth and he kept like, he was really confident, kept talking over everyone else. And I just remember thinking, oh, really annoying. And then they broke us into two rooms. And I remember thinking, I'm not in the same room as that guy. And it was this thing where I remember thinking, oh, he was really confident. I bet they really liked him. So I bet I'm in the like room where I'm about to be sent home. And then they said, oh, you guys are all going through. And it it really I made me think it was probably one of those little moments where you go, oh, it doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to be like the alpha confident person in the room. Um, and I remember actually um, Jess Roberts, who is, she still works at OMD and me now. I remember saying to her afterwards, I really thought that when that guy got put in the other room, um, that, you know, that was going to be the success room. And she was like, oh, God, no, he was so annoying. Absolutely no way. No way we put him through. And I remember it was the first little bit where I started to think, this is a really cool place. Like, I, you know, I really, like, enjoyed it. Anyway, so then I, at the end of that day, they offered me the job. So I never even went to the TBWA interview because I was like, I'm going to take this job with both hands. Mm, like, yeah. It's in London, they're in Paddington, like, they've got really cool offices. Um, yeah, so I took the job and started a couple of weeks later. Love that. Amazing. Yeah, and great. interestingly, Zav, CEO of Havas London, who we had on the sh on the show, he shared a similar experience where he thought he had to try and be this alpha person at some oh. point. And his boss just said, look, man, this is that's not the guy we interviewed. Mm -hmm. Just be yourself. Well, You're not that person. Mm -hmm. And it was like a moment where he realized, wow, I can be I can be myself in the industry. I'm not an alpha. I'm not a, you know, loud person. And it's done him really well, obviously, you know. And that's a it's a great message for anybody yeah. looking to be a leader is that does not mean confidence and loud mouth. And I think that's really heartening, isn't it? And it also shows I do I think it also shows the importance of like 
that recruitment process and being clear on like obviously it's skills based also but it's also attitudinal and the types of people and personalities you want to bring into your organization um yeah so that was really cool and um so I got a job as a graduate planner yeah which was great and I my first clients were uh Harp Collins book publishers cool which was very cool I think they used to put the grads on that because you'd get like literally they'd have budgets of like 25 grand <laughs> they were like I'll give that to the grad um I'm sure they spend a bit more money now um and then uh the other clients I worked on were RAC, RAC and BS, uh, BSH BSH the driving school. BSM oh, BSM yeah. driving school exactly so and, yeah, and this this is where something really interesting happens which we had not ever had before on this show you're you know in this graduate role bright eyed taking it all in new world and most are just excited to be there and see see how it goes you see the ceo walking around maybe in their office mm. and you have a very different thought what is that when you'd see the ceo what was going through your mind i was just like i want to do that job that looks really cool i i really did i used, i would be like i want to be the ceo of this business one day that would be the best fun ever to have that job but where, where does that think you come from that's not that's not normal is it not? No. I don't know. Like, I just, yeah. I mean, I suppose I've always been really ambitious. And I've always, like, had quite a lot of self-confidence, I think. Not necessarily at any point would I say, oh, I could do that job now. But I was just like, I could do that job one day. Like, if I, like, stick and focus and really work at it, I could do that job and that would be so fun. What what did what was going to, what did you like about it? What did you think it was cool about it? Do you remember? It's just that he was the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to have clients going in and out of his office and like you know he'd like do the big company meetings and stand up and be really inspirational to people um like get to be in all the pitches and you know i just yeah i just used to watch him like doing his thing and think yeah i'd love to do that interesting and you wanted mm -hmm. to do it at omd or you just thought yeah be yeah so cool yeah i definitely yeah it was de i've never like really had my head turned by another agency mm -hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, you're still, a, yeah, a graduate this time. What, what you, you decide, right, I'm going to be the CEO of this company. Where, how do you start that process? I mean, may, I think maybe that's why my career journey has been like relatively linear because I've always been going, well, if I want to do that one day, I've kind of just got to like gra work gradually work my way up. So I think, I think my mindset in my career has always been like not, I've definitely, I'm not the type of person that is, um, unhappy or uncomfortable in my current role I think what I've always been is like here's the role I'm doing right now and that this is the one that I want to do next and if I want to get there what are the things that I need to do and demonstrate to get me there as quickly as I can mm -hmm. get there and I think it's that it's probably that that focus is probably again like going back to what we talked about in my like childhood I think it is that level of focus is is something that comes quite naturally to me just to be like not in a and this is you know when come on to talk more about it, I do believe that you don't have to be like you can be focused without being like really ruthless and going like get out of my way everyone else never been like that it's just been like to me it's quite a logical thing like fix your eyes on the next role that you want to do and then just work out well how do I get there? what's the best way of getting there make sure that you you're clear on what the steps are the things that you need to demonstrate make sure you're clear on the people that are stakeholders that would need to be on board for you to get there be really clear with people on what your ambitions are because I think it's quite surprising how uh, rare it is for people to uh, be honest about their ambitions and mm -hmm. what they want to do and be and again it doesn't have to be about like being arrogant or I just think it's about like having a good relationship with the, per the person or the people that can help you get there and then making sure that together you've got that really focused plan. Because I just think it helps you, it helps you like work out each day, each month, each year, what you say yes and no to, what you do and don't do, um, the things that you need to demonstrate. So I think I've probably done that like throughout my career. Like I always remember Dan Clays, who was, it was when he was, he must have been managing director and I had an appraisal with him. And it was the bit where you talk about what you want to do in your future. I remember saying to him, well, I want your job one day, like that's the next, you know. The, Which role were would, you in at the time? I think I was maybe a client partner. So I was like relatively senior, but okay. maybe a couple of steps off his role. And he would always say to me that, 
still to me now, like, wow, um, not many people say that. And I think it is that thing of like, what I try and was try and say to people that I work with or coach or mentor is like, it might make you feel uncomfortable to say it, but practice saying it and then say it out loud at the right moment to the right person. Because what have you got to lose? If that's what you want, what have you got to lose to be open and like brave with those ambitions? And I also think it helps you uh, realize if you're wasting your time in that job. Yeah. If that person can't give you with some with a degree of clarity what it is that you would need to get to the next level, if that's what you want, right? If you're ambitious and you're looking to um, climb the ladder, which I presume most people listening to this podcast will be, um, I, I do think that you need to have that direct conversation. Are you an agency or brand that would like to work with our production company, Unity and Motion? If so, contact us at unityandmotion.com. We produce commercials and social content for brands such as Chanel, Amazon, Reebok, Harrods, The Ritz, and many more. Now back to the show. So you go from this graduate role and you spend three years as a planner and then you step up to communications planning manager, so your first manager role, mm -hmm. and spend a couple of years in that role, and then you get up to associate director. Is that associate director of what? Uh, Department, the company? No, that was on a client. That would have been on um, Vodafone, which okay. my main client. So that journey from graduate job to director, what can you remember that you did to, to, to get that role? So to make those kind of leaps? Specifically, most of that part of my career, like I said, I was working on Vodafone. And I think um, I worked with some great clients at the time. And I think it was probably just by doing a really good job with those clients. Again, some of whom I'm still in contact with now, actually, who do various marketing jobs in um, like different different clients, different clients and um, agencies. I think it was, and I do think this is why um, media agencies or like generally marketing, like specifically within a media agency, it's a great place to be if you're ambitious because if you are demonstrating on a client that you can do a brilliant job and you can build that relationship and they like you and they're telling your boss that they like you, that progression is, is that path is relatively smooth and there shouldn't be too much that gets in your way if you can like attach yourself to a, a client and show that you can really deliver on what they're looking for. Can you remember what you did to to get them to to, to like you and de and demonstrate you're doing great work? And um, Part of it is about partnerships and relationships and understanding what it is that those clients are looking for. Obviously, within the briefs that we, the, you know, the, the briefs and the tasks that we've been given as an agency, but also, like, the brief behind the brief. Like, what is it that they're actually trying to achieve for themselves personally and how can you really help them get there? I think a lot of what we do in agency world you know is we're a service business so i think the closer you can get to your clients really understand what success looks like for them like really get ahead of the briefs outside of the briefs build those relationships at all levels you've really got everything at your fingertips then and then really the job in my job at the time was then to i guess orchestrate the right people you know it's not like it's definitely like all um, agencies are like big team efforts right so it was then about orchestrating and working out who are the very best people I can pull in to this client um, to deliver the very best work and you know help make them be happy and you know help to grow their business it reminds me of something as we mentioned too so Ash and I are both uh, coaches and and um, one thing that we, we talk about and teach is the win-win-win yeah. philosophy or approach where you're always looking in any partnership or any business deal and this is what you seem to have done is what are the three wins there's a win for you yeah there's a win for this other person yeah. who's who delivered this brief which might not even be on the brief but there's yeah. something that they want to achieve in this whether it's looking good to their boss or trying a new technology or whatever and the third win is the wider system you know and yeah. in that case it's their organization and if you've got all those three wins in it's it's a it's a groundwork for a really long term sustainable relationship because yeah. everybody's winning. And if you lose one of those, then it's going to fall down at some point. I think that's a great way to think about it. And I also think like if you do that well, the other thing you can do is avoid wasting energy and effort. 
because I, you know, I still see, a, I still see too much of that going on. It's like, you know, when everyone's just doing everything that they're asked for without going, hang on a minute, let's just, let's just really, to your point, what is in the middle of that Venn diagram of winning? <laughs> like, where should we really be like focusing our efforts, really prioritizing what's the absolute like must do and do super, super well yeah. versus the stuff that, you know, you can't always do everything that you're asked to do so and I think that's probably the same with progression point it's like really trying to get as clear and focused as possible on what are the things that are going to have the most impact the most return and um, for you but also for all your stakeholders so um you get to a point in your career where you don't leave the organization but you sort of take a sidestep into another organization yeah. tell us what happened here I was probably about seven or eight years into my career and um Omnicom Media Group um, was so there's a there's a an agency called Drum within Omnicom Media Group, which is a, um, a branded content agency. It used to sit within one of the media agencies within PhD, and at the time it was being pulled out of PhD and being made a central service to service all of our agencies, all of our clients. Um, and the lady who was um, kind of establishing that at the time um, asked me if I would go and be their client services director. So at the time that was like a big step up. Um, and it was a big opportunity to go and work with lots of different agencies, lots of different clients. Um, and the bit that really attracted me to the job was um, the opportunity to learn more about the creative side of the business, the creative sale production side of it. Drum used, at the time was a kind of full service production entity as well. So they had edit suites, recording studios. So the opportunity to go and learn that side of things I knew would be good for me, would push me out of my comfort zone. Um, so I went and did that for about a year and a half, um, which was awesome. Like there was a big part of me that was, uh, it was kind of, I guess it was a bit of a safe sidestep because it. I was still working with OMD, but working in a different capacity, like bringing like new services into the agency. Um, and I think if I'm honest as well, it was probably the only point in my career at OMD where I'd hit a little bit of a, like a plateau. Okay. Because I remember at the time I'd asked a couple of times to be moved off this night that I'd worked on for a long time. And they were like, no, 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 it's, it'll happen, it'll happen. They love you. Let's just like keep you there. Let's keep you there. And I'd, I'd asked a few times. And I remember it kept coming back. And they said, then when, you know, this other person came to approach me to go, well, how about? I was like, mm. yeah, sure. But I think I knew that because I'd still be working with OMD, it'd let me keep my, you know, my connections going. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that for... 18 months which was really good and it was a really good pivot and I definitely had a big like learning curve uh, I was yeah like I said I was totally out of my comfort zone well, what would you say to someone who's in their career and they feel like they're experiencing a plateau look I am a big believer for lots of reasons in like trying to craft a career for yourself within an organization like I do think when you do that you're every year you're building up a ton of equity and there's you know, there are times in your life where that is super important and definitely pays back. At the same time, like if you're hitting a plateau and you've done all the things you should be doing, like I say, you, you've spoken to your line manager, you've asked what you need to do to progress, you've made your feelings super clear, you've asked for timelines and you're not getting what you need back from that, from your workplace. I mean, I don't think that to me that is the moment when you need to look around you and go well, what is it is it me is it them like try and work out what it is um but I don't think anyone for any reason no matter what life stage you're in if you're looking to progress and you can't find that at your current organization I think that so, you know it is I, I what I haven't done in my career is kind of like just blindly stay at a company because it's safe it, I have always felt like there's really good progression a really good progression path ahead of me yeah um this, this, I guess the thing I would say is the grass can like look greener on the other side. So I would say like make sure that you've really had that conversation first. Like make sure you've given it a really good go and you've like bought your half of the bargain to that partnership that you've got with your current employer yeah. to try and find the pass through. And then if you're not getting it, then yeah, that's time to take the next step. So it's about this time that you got to a stage where you think about having children. Yeah. And uh, I think you go through something here, which I think a lot of people will resonate with and may have experienced themselves. Tell us, you know, you're expecting a child at some point and talk us through what happens. Um, yeah, so um, me and my husband 
like got married, I think probably about a year after I'd been at drum. Um, and we decided we wanted a family. I mean, we'd always knew we wanted a family. So, uh, yeah, we, um, we started trying for a family and actually the, um, the first, like uh, the first time I got pregnant, I then really like sadly had a miscarriage at 12 weeks. So it was pretty sad. I knew I was pregnant with twins actually. I don't really ever talk about this very much. So I'd had like early scans. I knew it was identical twins. You know, you kind of set this life up yourself already in your head. You've like played it forwards 18 years or so. And then, yeah, it was really, it was really sadly, um, we lost, we lost the twins at 12 weeks, um, which was, yeah, I mean, at the time it's one of those things, like I think now with hindsight, you look back and, you know, sadly, the older you get, the more you have friends who have like fertility, you know, issues along the way. But I think at the time you think like, what does this happen? Is this happening to me? And I think, I, I think it is still a taboo. I still don't think it's talked about as much as it should be. But certainly at the time, I didn't really realize it was such a sadly common occurrence. And then it's one of those things when you have a miscarriage, you suddenly realize that loads of other people have had miscarriages too, but don't haven't necessarily, you know, talked openly about them. How did you sort of cope with the emotional and, and physical sort of uh, impact of, of having a, a miscarriage? Um, so I think, uh, so I actually had two miscarriages. I had an, I had um, a miscarriage in between, like before having each of my children actually. Um, and I think one was when I was at drama and one was when I was back at OMD. And I think both times actually, when I look back at it now, I didn't really talk to people. I definitely didn't disclose it at work. Like I didn't talk to, you know, the people team. But actually the, the first time it happened, I had to go and have, I had to like uh, be in hospital for a little while. So I did have some time off, but I didn't say why. Really? And I look back now and I think, oh, that's really sad. I just think there was part of me that felt, um, maybe I was not really ready to share and talk about it. Cause obviously when it's happening to you at the time, it's mm. super like emotional and you know, you're, you're grieving for a, a loss. Um, uh, but also probably I think it wasn't like at the time, like, you know, I hadn't ever heard anyone else talk about it at work. Like we didn't have necessarily policies for it at work. So, you know, now we have, you know, pregnancy loss policies. We will talk about those publicly. Um, Obviously, it's up to the individual how publicly they want to share those experiences. But certainly, I feel like within our organization, I hope at least that certainly when these things are happening to people at work, there's definitely a circle of trust of people that know and are supporting people through it. So I think that probably was my personal choice. And I am like quite a private person actually about that kind of stuff. But it, I think when I when I think now about the work that we do to create um like policies at work, like anything around women's health, really, whether it's fertility, menopause, whatever it is, I do think um, like policy making is really important because just by knowing there's something there and there's like, you know, I mean, our pregnancy loss policy is you get two weeks off. It's not actually, you know, it's really standard and quite often actually not appropriate for the individual. So we will always talk to the person involved and make sure they have what they need. But I think there's partly something about just having the policy and knowing that it's there and knowing that it can be talked about and you've got the right person to go and talk to is mm, yeah is really important because I think it's it's huge it's a hugely difficult period of lots of people's lives actually and at, whether it's pregnancy loss or just pregnancy I think lots of women go through a lot before they'll talk to their employers about the journey that they're going on is it hard to just sort of go back into work and act like everything's fine when actually you're grieving yeah, I th yeah, it is. It is, and I and I think a different people will cope with it in a different in different ways. And sometimes it's quite helpful to go into work and just go right. I'm just going to go to work today and like give myself a bit of a head, like a brain break from it, and I'm going to go and be my professional self. And there can be a bit of like relief in that. Mm. Um, but I do, I I really believe that people will perform better at work if they feel fully supported and if they're able to share with like the right people what's going on in their personal lives. And there's adjustments are made for that and like you know people feel able where they are really struggling to take the time have the break um which i think you know i do think you know things have really moved on and we're in a better place than we were but i'm sure you know as always there's loads more we need to do what what advice do you have for anybody listening who may have recently gone through a miscarriage or is going through the grieving process of that i think like firstly don't feel like 
don't feel like there's anything to be ashamed or don't feel like there's anything to hide. It's not a taboo subject as much as it was. And I think like make sure that if you feel able to, I would absolutely recommend that you've spoken to the right people at work, but obviously your HR team, but also your line manager and your close colleagues and say that you've got that support like network around you because it is just it's like a horribly it can feel like a really lonely experience I think and you've got real worries about I like and look back now thankfully with my two children and say it was like horrendously difficult period of my life but we I came out of it with an amazing family and I think when you're going through it you don't know that that's going to be the case and it can feel really lonely and really isolating um and you've got to be kind to yourself and like and just balance what else you're trying to deliver whilst you're kind of going through that period yeah yeah I see that um thank you for sharing i'm sure thank you for sharing. no doubt valuable for, for as you said it's something that's much more common than, than we might yeah, think definitely is um and it was about this time that you you moved from drum back into omd and were client partner yeah uh how did that happen so i was on maternity leave and i think i probably knew by that point that i actually I really missed it. <laughs> and I think like... Um, you wanted I, that Sierra job again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, and actually, do you know what it was? Partly because when I'd been at Drum, Dan Case, who I've already talked about once, but he had come in to be the managing director at AMD and I'd worked with him on a couple of really cool projects with Boots and a few other things. And he was really mixing it up and changing it up at AMD. And we had a really good relationship. And the thing that I really miss, I miss being like the heart of the client relationship because mm. Drum... As Drum, we would go in and we would work with the media agencies, collaborate together to take stuff to clients. But, you know, there'd be the occasions where the person who used to be in my role would be like, no, we don't actually need you in this meeting. We're going to, you know, or the client, sorry, the client said no for X, Y, Z reason. And I'd be thinking, well, how about we say, or I would say, how about we say, you know, blah, 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 blah. And maybe we could try this. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, we'll give that a go. And then, you know, if they'd come back and say, yeah, it's still a no, I'm like, and it just, I used to have that thing where I'm like, I just really missed being like in this, like right in the center. And I think that's the thing that I love about the jobs that I do. I love the partnerships we get to build with our clients. I love the ways in which we get to really understand their businesses and what it is that they're trying to achieve. And then like the the influence we can have on that, like the way we can pull different people's, you know, capabilities stuff together to help them like solve their, like, you know, their challenges or deliver against a brief and I really miss doing that. So when I was on Matt Leave, I, um, I went first to speak to Philippa Brown, who was the CEO of OMG at the time, to kind of get her blessing, really, to go and have a conversation with Dan and say, can I come back, please? <laughs> um, to which he was I'm like... i your job, but I want to come back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to want to move on at some point, right? So. <laughs> I am your succession plan. <laughs> yeah. I've done it all for you. <laughs> um, which, like, happily, he was like open arms to that so yeah that's great and then he's actually been my boss ever since that point because uh, he's yeah he's still my boss now so. yeah. and like just scaling back a little bit to just before you moved into that position so you mentioned that you were on maternity leave mm -hmm. how was that was this with your first with your yeah. first child how was that because i know it can be quite challenging for women to go on that leave to have children while going up a career path as well do you know what i i, I can only really talk from my own personal experience, but both times I've been on maternity leave, I feel like I've been able to pretty quickly just go, like flip, flip a bit of a switch and go, of course you've got that transition period that the first week or two after you've like finished on mat leave and you're like, your brain is unraveling from everything you've got to live. But it's such a long period of time that for me, both times, yeah, I've been able to really step out of it and go like, now I'm like, I, I get to be a mum, like, and, you know, that's my, like, sole, like, focus and purpose for the next, like, 10, 11 months or however long I had off on um, maternity leave. Um, I also think that there's something about maternity leave which is a really nice opportunity to, like, take a step away and to reset. And, like, when you go back to kind of, like, refocus on what you want next. Because you don't, like, it's really rare in a career to get that kind of length of a break. So you get an opportunity to go, right, which behaviours and patterns do I want to leave behind and which do I want to like bring I'm going to give the most like basic example of that now but when I left Matt leave I was like when I come back I'm not going to use my Blackberry anymore this makes me sound old right wow, but I was Blackberry. totally addicted to Blackberry I used to see people on their iPhones and be like I can't do it like I'm so and it was 
that is the most like trivial example but it was that thing where i was like no i've had like 10 months off i'm going to come back i'm not going to use that thing anymore i'm going to get an iphone i'm going to do but also you that could... is trivial but i mean let's if we make a 2023 example of that you could just put the word tiktok in there yeah and the amount of hours people spend on let's just call them habits that are not yeah. pr not helpful for our progression totally. is massive it's massive and i think there's loads of other ways of thinking about that when you are coming back to work of really being like what are the things you want to actively leave behind and it's quite good if you can to think about those things quite soon after you leave i think to go right what's you know what are the things that i could put in the car park now and like not come back to but then like the closer you get to coming back it's like what are the what are the new behaviors what are the new focus areas what like even from a like a how you show up point of view like there's like those are things that you can mix up when you've had that that kind of a break which i think is quite a unique opportunity you don't get opportunities like that too many times in your career so i think you can like you know flip it to be a you know a bit like to make it a bit more of a positive um a positive evolution like when you have that time off and yeah i don't think i don't think either time that i was on mat leave i wasn't worried about and this is like testament to like i'm doing omg really that i've never i didn't go off thinking oh like someone's going to come for my job when i'm gone like it was always like no it's good like i'll have my break when i get back i'll be ready to like have a good conversation about mm. like what i come back to do and i've always known and felt really confident that my career could pick up pick back up where i left off which I know isn't the case. I know I've been really lucky in that sense and that's not been the case for everyone. I mean, I guess my primary bit of advice I would be to, if you're having children as much as you can, like fight to find the employer that is gonna, where you feel like you can go off and have your babies without like that becoming a barrier in the way to your career. And they do exist, lots of them out there. And if you don't feel like you're getting that, like you need to be looking around. Mm. Come to OMD. Come to OMD. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so let's talk about the the next phase of life a phase <laughs> you've been through having the children <laughs> or having <laughs> or physically <laughs> having the children <laughs> oh, yeah just to be clear <laughs> i mean yeah being a father or a mother yeah. of children Be becoming a parent of, of children and working how was that for you and how how did you manage it <laughs> you've got some good advice in this area. yeah I think, and I do think, like, I know you're very much in it right now, aren't you, with the ages of your kids because they're so young. And I do think, again, like, with lots of things that like, you could, I kind of look back, I, don't get me wrong, I'm definitely still at a point in my life where my kids are seven and nine, so they still need a lot from me. But I think it's that bit where you're, like, your kids are very young, they're preschool age, like, it just tends to be that, like, you'll be, you know, often you're in your 30s, so your career is, like, really still like growing and evolving and accelerating um and it i just think it can be a really really difficult time why is it difficult everyone needs lots from you at that point in your life like when we were talking the other day it's like you don't really get that much respite because your kids are still like lightly waking you up at night likely waking up at 5 30 in the morning likely you know you know that every t every moment that they're awake you are like having to be on them <laughs> so you don't want to turn your back for too long it's not like you, they're old enough where you can just stick them in front of a film and like you know go for a walk around the block or anything like they're not at that point yet and then you know you're at an, like in a potentially an intense point in your career as well so I, I I remember those years as like very very exhausting um and I think look I think my my advice to people in those years is firstly um like no it won't last forever and I don't know anyone who is in that point in their life who is like yeah yeah it's a breeze I've got it all sewn up let me tell you how because it just I just don't like it's almost like a bit of a physical impossibility if you've got a job and you've got kids and you're both working and all that kind of stuff there's just only so many hours in the day and there's a lot that people want from you so I think there's a bit which is about just trying to make sure in every way that you can that you've got as much support as you can afford like and that you can like find <laughs> Whether that's, you know, whether that's friends, family, childcare, whatever it is. I think there's a bit where there's a period in your life where it's really worth investing in that support as much as you are able to. I also think, know that everything isn't fixed. Like, I remember at that point, like me and my husband used to sit down a lot and go, right, what's working? What's not? What do we need to change? Like, what worked six months ago isn't working anymore. Like, you know, because the, the kids, you blink and they're like, 
you know, six months is a long time when they're three or five, or whatever. What can we change? Like, what are you finding hard? What am I finding hard? Like, how can we support each other better? I think having those regular, like, almost like life meetings where you go, this doesn't have to be fixed. This isn't it. Like, we can change this up, right? You've got to feel like you've got your own, like, I guess you've got a bit of, des- you can control your destiny a little bit, I think, um, is really important. It's interesting you say that because you mentioned there, like, yeah, having having a, a family meeting. It's very similar to what you did, your dad did with you. Yeah. Right? Sit down every year and review <laughs> and go, okay, what works, what's not working at school? What keeps coming up? What do we need to change? Yeah, it's probably all roads lead back to my dad, basically. <laughs> <don't they? laughs> but again, great life lessons. But I think, I do think, like, I, I've never really understood why. And I obviously don't, like, having a, I do have to be careful how I talk to my husband about this because he doesn't like being called to a meeting. But, like... Do you know what I mean? I always think there's stuff that we do in our working lives that wouldn't that actually make loads of sense to bring in some way, shape, or form into our personal so, life. Yeah. Not like a praise or some stuff, but do you know what I mean? Like we don't do it. Like you just the danger with when you've got lots of stuff going on is you just get your head down and you crack on. And I think there is merit in that at times, but there's also merit in like those moments where you take a step back, you think of everything at your that you possibly have at your disposal that could make even an incremental difference to those months and years when it's all very, very intense. And don't, you know, I think this is not uniquely a female thing, but I do think in those years, women take on a lot. Like they take on nursery admin, like early school admin, like all that kind of stuff. And I think it's one of those things where you also, in those moments where you check in, like work out, are you, have you got the right division of stuff? Like. I, I really, this time I was actually with my daughter, not funny really, she, I think she was in reception and I'd forgotten to fill in the flu spray form and she'd got, they lined up as a class to have the flu spray and I remember her like coming home and being like, I didn't have the flu spray mummy because you hadn't filled in the form and everyone else got a badge and I didn't get one and I didn't get my flu spray and I was like, you know, it was one of those moments when you were in the thick of it and you just think, oh, mm. God. Like, that day, she would have felt a bit alone. Yeah, I think she had a few tears at school and, I, and then she didn't have the freeze break. Then I had to pay for it. You know, it's just like all extra like admin. Yeah. And I was just like, so at that moment, it was one of these things that was like the trigger to call one of these like meetings with my husband. And we just agreed like from that point onwards, he was like, let me take the school admin because he was quite good at that stuff and I'm generally not. Um, so it was just that bit where you just constantly are looking at stuff and going, is there another way? Have we got this right? Like, let's reevaluate because it, it, yeah, it's difficult. And all at the same time, you are like, you're approaching, you know, or becoming a managing director of mm. this very large organization that's yeah. working with huge clients, massive responsibilities. And yeah, you've got the flu, flu, <laughs> 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 forms to fill out flu forms. That's why the flu form didn't get done. You know, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a huge lot. amount. Yeah, it is a lot. I think what's really interesting about this time, you approached your, well, your managing director role, which came up, you, was it this time that you didn't work five days a week? Yeah, I used, I mean, I've done all sorts of weird and wonderful working patterns, but I did use, yeah, I was working three and a half days at the time. As an, as a managing director. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really, I think, unique. And I think there's a lot of, yeah, value people can learn in, in terms of like, how, how did you, um. Firstly, how did you get the MD role? And then we want to find out, you know, how you sort of managed to make that work, mm. that it is actually possible. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So actually, when when I became managing director, I that we didn't have a managing director at the time at OMD. So, like Dan, my boss, had been promoted up to CEO, and we had um, three managing partners, and we were like all managing different parts of the business, so that we didn't have a managing director in place at the time. So. But I thought we needed one. And I could see, like, I could just see a bit of a gap and an opportunity, like, forming. We did have a managing director previously, but we'd just gone through a period of not having one. Why did you think you needed one? Um, I could definitely see, like, opportunities to, like, support my boss at the time, like, more and create more opportunities for us, the business, do more for our clients by, like, reinstating this managing director role. Um... So, like, what I I wrote a pitch for him. It was quite short. I mean, make, wrote a pitch makes it sound really grand, mm. but I I did. I pulled together a pitch for the role. Put some slides together. Put some slides together. Plucked up the courage, um, and went in and 
like had a conversation with him about it and said is it that, nerve-wracking doing that yes probably but also because we i think like, the way i look back look at these things is what's the worst that can happen is he says no actually not not, not right now mm. that's the worst that can happen and that's not that bad but i think it helps that dan and i have a great relationship so that probably gave me like again like it's like I felt very psychologically safe that like he wasn't going to laugh me out of the room or even if it was like a oh maybe maybe but not right now or something that he would I was had the confidence I guess he would manage that super well yeah so I went in there and I was like right I've got this thing I want to talk to you about um I may I can't remember whether I pre-sold it or not I don't think I did and then said here's the reasons why I think we need this role and then here's the reasons why I think this should be me and he agreed there and then just like that mm, no probably not there and then I from memory it was like he was definitely very warm to it, like, from the off. I'm sure he'd been having similar thoughts, actually. Yeah. Um, and then, so we kind of crafted it, crafted it and shaped it together. Um, and then, yeah, he created the role. And I will always, I'll never forget when he had told the agency that, like, that I was going to be my managing director. It was at our summer party and, like, everyone was so excited and I was really excited. And it felt like it was definitely, like, one of the proudest moments of my career because I love OMD. And I was like, to get to be the managing director of this agency is really cool. Um, and you're now just pretty much one step away from your your end goal that you started, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. touching this. many years ago. Yeah. And I think what's interesting what you said there, which uh, Phil Thomas, who's chairman of Can Lines, mentioned on the show, which was when you're, you know, looking to forge forward in your career and life, that if you can, especially in that sort of managing partner role or, M or even md role if you can help the the c-suite or help the ceo with areas and say yeah. look i'm going to take this responsibility yeah. on I mean, and i'm going to focus on something i'm really good at that's exactly what they need because they've got so many things going on you can be that person you, effectively what you did look look i can help with this yeah the solution we need but it goes back to your winning win 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 because it's like you get to win because i can do this the company and the business gets to win because I can help do X, Y, Z and I get to win because I get this dream job. Like, so I think a lots of the like thought processes are the same as probably what I've always learned to do on clients is really understand like how to like support and help and, you know, like move things forward. Um, but do it like, you know, there's no reason you can't apply that to your own career. Let's talk about now the, um, the three and a half days, most people think, you know, an MD role has been described to us, you know, as like one of the busiest moments of your career, like even uh, versus CEO role, it's like, oh, the MD time was crazy. It's just nonstop. Everybody wants you. Yeah. Emails flying in about the toilets it's frozen. Mass infestation. Lines in the, you know, <laughs> yeah, plus yeah. running everything. Yeah. So for someone who thinks three and a half days a week, I need that because I've got all this other stuff going on in my life. How did you do it? How did you make it work? Did it work? So I would say, I don't like, so I, looking back now, I actually, I only did it on three and a half days for a short period of time, mainly because my son was going to like nursery preschool. So I think I did it only, I think I only did it for a few months on three and a half days and then I moved up to four days. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, which actually does make a world of difference. I'm sure. Um, so... I think, like, I think that's probably, I don't think I did it on three and a half days for very long. I did do it on four days for a while. And I think that's totally possible. I think um, probably in some ways, potentially more than even when you're in, like, running a big client. Like, I do think it's, like, most of these things are possible if you've got the right team around you and it's sort of the work, everything's spread out in the right way and you've got that kind of safety net on the days that you're, that's your non-working day. But I think, like, with anything, I think... You've got to be really focused. You've got to, like, set your boundaries as well. Know, like, what you can and can't do, what you, what, like, what you're going to say no to. And then I remember I used to think really hard, like, on the three days when I'd be, like, in the office, I'd be like, I've really got to make my impact felt on these three days. Because if I'm then going to work from home every day and then I'm going to be off for the fifth day, I've got to make this count. And I think, like, that's probably something that having kids did for me, where I'd be like, if I'm going to work... I'm going to make it count. Like, I don't want to spend time away from my kids unless it counts. And I think that, like, gave me extra, like, impetus for, you know, and I think I'm a big believer in, like, trying to be as intentional as possible about the way you show up and the way you spend your time. Um, Like, 
thinking through like, okay, so if you're coming back to work and you want to work a different pattern, how are you going to make sure? And this doesn't, this isn't about, um, you know, being an extrovert and being really loud or like, you know, that, but it's like on the days that you are there and the time that you are going to spend like in the office or at work, like what are the ways in which you can make sure that your presence is felt, that your impact is felt, that you're merchandising the work that you do, right? That you're not, I do think you have to think more about that if you're, especially if you're trying to um, demonstrate that the, like a new working pattern is going to work. Like if someone else has done it before you, like it's probably that little bit easier. But if you're doing it for the first time, I do think you have to think smartly about, you know, making sure that all your stakeholders know what you're doing, making sure that they, you know, that, you've, that you use that time that you've got face to face really wisely. How do you have the conversation to, and how did you do it to, to get everybody on board with you doing three and a half or four days a week? Do you know, what? I think, again, this is probably like an OMD thing, but it was never, the, it was never really questioned. I think like, like Dan's, the relationship I've had with Dan is like in the different working patterns that I've had, he's always been like, give it a go. Mm. Like, let's see, okay. like not absolutely 100% forever in a day you can do that working pattern. Cause you know, I don't think that's responsible either, but he's always been like, okay, well let's, let's try it. Let's see, let's, you know, tell me if it's not working, let's work together and let's, you know, do it for however many weeks, months, whatever it is which I think it actually works best for both parties anyway. You want to know that, like, let's let's try it. And then if it's not working, we'll look for another option. So I think that's always the, that would be my advice also for people coming back in is don't necessarily, if you're asking your employer to do something a bit different, maybe don't, like, try and get to some kind of fixed written thing immediately. Position it as a trial and go, well, how about we do it for eight weeks? Like, what again, what's the worst that can happen? At the end of that eight weeks, let's revisit it. And then no one feels like they're signing themselves up for something that is going to create a really difficult conversation further down the line. And then it also gives you the, you know, again, that stretch of time to really think about how you make it work. Mm. And I think nine times out of 10, certainly in my experience of people coming in in different patterns, it works. The thing I do think you've got to do though is when you're asking, and this might be a bit more controversial, I don't know, but when you're asking for flexibility, I do think you've got to be willing to show some flexibility in the reverse. Like if you're asking for all of it, but never willing to give any of it back, I do think that's when it can get difficult. So when, even when I was doing my three and a half days, there would definitely be times where I'd work an extra day that week, something was going on. Yeah. And you know, not all the time. And if you're doing it all the time, what's the point? You might as well just be working full time. <laughs> But like being able to have some flexibility, like in your arrangements, I think is is really important. You describe something there, which is is uh, really helpful. I think when trying something new, which is uh, a tote, which is ba- which stands for test, operate, test, exit, mm. which allows you to basically experiment something without, as you said, it's not like oh, this is in written is going to happen forever but I'm going to start it. I'm going to test doing three and a half days a week. Yeah. And then review, operate, review. How is this working? Is this working well? Is it not? What do I need to change? Test again. Okay, maybe I'll do four days a week now and see if that works. And the exit point is when you've done enough rounds of that test, operate, test that you've you've found us something that works. Yeah. And then exit, the tote's done. That process allows you... um, I'm learning a lot today. I love it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that test operate test thing is like, I guess, a lot of what we've been talking about. And that's that, I guess that is my, the one thing I'd say about that, that period of your life where your kids are really young is you're going to have to keep doing that all the time because the they're going to keep you on your toes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> smashing bowl. In Ashley's case, told me the other day, smash some. Smashing bowls. My, my youngest. You give her something to smash, she'll smash it. Really? Yeah, but not just any bowls. There weren't just any bowls. They were my partner's 30th birthday commemoration bowls. Yeah. All of them in how many seconds? There was two of them. Two of them in two seconds. Literally, as soon as she got in the cupboard, smash, smash. <laughs> I think you might have to get some cupboard locks, some plastic bowls. We did. We ended up having to twine the cupboards like a, like a Tutankhamun's tomb with cord. <laughs> that worked for a while. <laughs> They're good stories to collect for their like 18th and 21st birthdays, though. For sure. Yeah. For sure. You can get her some bowls for her 18th so well i was i was allowed to take some more bowls those the rest of those bowls to a shoot last week 
like a like a, a bold gentleman, I decided to try and carry everything from the car to the front door. Daddy smashed in them. one. Partner came to the door. What are you doing? Perfect timing, or you could say awful timing for me. Smash, smash. Two more bowls. No. Like we have father, father, like father, like, <laughs> father, like daughter. Yeah, you know, I'm really interested in the fact that your partner owns thirtieth birthday commemorative bowls. Though that's <laughs> well, like, quite a statement. They don't have like thirty on them. No, just really nice bowls that she chose. Those are the ones that I'm. I'm on the hunt for some more bowls. I bet you are. <laughs> I bought some uh, some flowers and stuff, and I think I'm I'm in good good standing. You sell bowls. Please get in touch. <laughs> Actually, he's very interesting. <laughs> but I think that, that the the tote thing, though, going back to the tote, I think that's a really important thing because even when when I had my first, we had to look at okay. So Mondays are usually admin, quite quiet. Yeah. Fridays usually rounding up. Yeah. So I made Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday the days where I could come in. Yeah. to London and stuff like that. Monday and Friday would be me me and my little one. Yeah. I'd do a bit of admin and, and stuff like that. Yeah. I think I do think the other thing we talked about, a bit about this the other day is just like try not to give up on it because I think they like they are really hard years and you know that I think there probably is moments where you just think oh my god is this worth it like have I got it in me and I like I think that can happen like you know it's like it's well documented that like lots of divorces and separations happen when like people's kids are that young i think it's that bit where you just think just just don't give like not necessarily not that that might not be the right thing to do eventually but also don't give up in that eye of the storm moment when that moment does pass and it passes pretty quickly in the grand scheme of your life but when you're in it like it doesn't feel that way but when you're it's also that recognition of it is just going to be really hard mm. you've got to find all your coping mechanisms and then like Hang on to them. Yes, yeah, that's it. Don't give up. Don't give listening. up. Keep going. Yeah. Don't fall out. It's a test on your resilience. It really is. It really is. When you when you are when you have to go into the office if you've got work and you haven't really slept, so you've had two or three hours, it's been broken, but you're just like, here now, let's get on with it. <laughs> yeah, sleep deprivation's a real thing. It's like a form of torture, isn't it? So we go back to coming into this organization. As a, in a graduate role, mm -hmm. seeing that CEO role, thinking that's super cool. Quite like that. I love, yeah. I love what that's about. I want that job. We come to the moment where this comes true. Yeah. Mm. How does it happen? Tell us the story of this, the CEO role. Yeah. So it, it did come true. Um, so it was in December 2020 um, when there was a guy. Um, great guy called Tim Pearson who'd been um, operating as CEO of OMD Group. So I talked earlier about the two sister agencies. He was the CEO of both those agencies, um, was leaving to go and work at Sky at the time. That was the point at which Dan like, gave me the call and said, right, I mean, as you probably will have guessed by now, it wasn't like that he didn't know that I wanted to be CEO. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'd made that told clear. Him. I told him, I'd asked him when it was going to happen, you know, to but yes, yeah, so it was just it was December twenty twenty. So obviously, like pretty, it was like middle of COVID. Um, that he said, right now's the time. It's yours. Like here we go. Like now's the moment. And what did you feel when he said that? Amazing! It was really cool. Where I, were you? I was. I. I mean, I was in the my desk in my mm. like spare room. We all know what twenty twenty. Yeah, I mean, it was. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily how I would have visualized it happening. Yeah. back in. The, my graduate days but you know still like it was a really good it was a really big moment it was really exciting um and yes that was December 2020 so I officially took on the role in January 2021 so I'd had like the Christmas break I actually had COVID over that Christmas so I had but I had plenty of time to be like at home thinking about like this thing that was coming you know this massively little bit maybe um because these things are as an evolution, aren't they? So I think I'd gradually started to take on more of those responsibilities. Right. But no, I'd had like I'd had time to really think about it. I'd written myself a ninety day plan because that's what you do when you're moving yeah. into a new role. How did you, you know. get that idea? Did you read a book? And... Yeah, literally the book. What What is your the first ninety days? There we go. The book, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. you know. But I always read that book. Re I always reread that book when I'm starting a new role because I actually think it's a really useful way to frame your thinking and like properly think about. It. It's very good if you haven't read it. So, haven't yeah it sounds very good you should i mean it's like it's the classic like yeah. here's what here's what you should do put some structure around it stakeholders da, da, da. Mm. and so i was super excited about it 
um, maybe a little bit nervous. There wasn't there wasn't massive opportunity for me to go out and get a new wardrobe or anything, so I was just working at home. Um, maybe a new t-shirt or something. Um, that says, and... I'm a CEO. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> I made it. 16 years in the making. <laughs> yeah, that would have been cool. Missed that opportunity. Anyway, so then it happened. We got back to work. The kids went back to school for one day, and then we went back into another round of homeschooling. So uh, that was a bit... Um, tricky to say the least so I did I actually do you know what after all of that time of really wanting the job being so excited about doing it I have to be honest the first few months of that job I didn't particularly enjoy because it was homeschooling and I definitely got like I, I am definitely a naturally com- self-confident person I definitely believe in my own abilities but of all the points in my career that was the moment I had the biggest wobble that I was just like why what was what were you feeling because you wanted this since for 16 years and now you've got it and now you're like oh I don't know I know I think it was um I think it was definitely a moment in time thing I don't know how it would have played out if we hadn't been in that like fully like remote working situation but I definitely I'm I'm a natural ex- extrovert I love to be in the agency I get my energy from other people and I think there was something about like just sitting at home in that like slightly echo chamber scenario um, and I also think it was the thing of like finally that like kind of the final like umbrella of like someone above me obviously like you know you still have I still have lots of people above me in the network but from an OMDK point of view that, that that final like kind of layer had been removed and it was all mine on my shoulders and I just really suddenly felt the weight of it and I've never had that before even whenever I've like taken a step up I've never felt that like real like weight on my shoulders but I did um, and I you know that I there was definitely a few months where I was like yeah, this is pretty heavy. Um, we found out Channel 4 was going up for pitch, which is one of, of our founding clients. We've had it for we'd had it for like 36 years at the time. You know, there was lots of stuff still going on, lots of the like kind of ripples of like COVID coming through clients. And it was just, it was very difficult. Again, like I say, one of my favorite things about my job is the time I get to spend with clients, like really understanding what's going on. And again, like you can do that remotely, but it's not, the, you don't get the same, it's not the same, don't get the same level of connection that you do when you've been able to just go and sit down with that person face to face. If you could go back in time and know what you know now, now in 2023, what would you say to yourself about what just, yeah, what would you say to yourself? You're having a wobble, you're struggling. Do you know what? I probably have, I would probably say what my husband was saying to me at the time, which was, I remember going for like a walk around the block with him at night and, like, and him going, and I'm just going, do you know what? I genuinely am not. I'm not sure about this. I'm not, I'm not enjoying it. Like I'm finding it really stressful. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not, maybe actually after all this time, I'm not like cut out to do it. Wow. And he was just like, Laura, <laughs> give it some time. Like this is a, like, he was like, this is a particularly like, like stressful way to take on a new role. He was like, I absolutely believe that you will smash this. You will absorb it. Like don't, you know, just, just give yourself a bit of time, give yourself a bit of space which was great, like super useful because he knows me really well. And he was right. Like it was just, it was, it was a matter of a few months and being able to get back in the office a little bit more, like did work absolute wonders. Um, so I think it was probably three or four months of feeling a bit like that. Um, and then I kind of got through it. And ever since then, I've, I've loved doing the job. It's been amazing. We want to talk about your, your, a few key things that um, have led to you really succeeding in your career and life and basically how to how to run a successful business. Mm. So let's talk about those. And we've sort of broken them down into five key points based on what you've you've shared with us. So one of the first things you said you do is the quarterly focus. Yeah. Share a bit about that with us. So I think like uh I guess most businesses work on a calendar, annual, whatever your financial year is, like some kind of like annual cycle. And I tend to find that, like, that's great. And that definitely, like, gives you some, like, direction of travel. Mm. But what I do, and I've I've done this for quite a few years, actually. I think it was, a like, a coach, actually, who once introduced me to this practice of, like, once a quarter sitting down and really, like, framing what it is that you want to deliver in that period of time. Because it's a period of time that is long enough that you can achieve some things. Yeah. But it's short enough that you've got, like, a bit of a tight like time span and you can be again like focused on you know what it is that you want to achieve I think the thing that is really important to me in the way that I do that is I I make that like a whole life 
plan. Mm. So I don't just write down the things that I want to achieve at work in that quarter. I write down like everything. Because I do think, depending on what you've got going on outside of work, like will impact like, and and vice versa. If, you, if you've got a ginormous pitch going on at work, or like a huge project that you're trying to deliver, inevitably, like you probably need to think about how you're going to manage that with everything you're trying to deliver in your personal life. If you've got a massive like thing going on in your personal life, you're moving house, you're like, I don't know, having a kid, whatever it is, obviously you're going to have to really think about what you're trying to deliver professionally. So I think for me, like I, I do that pretty religiously, like once a quarter, reset it, put everything on a sheet. And it's, do you know, it's amazing when you write it all down, like how much it adjusts your frame of reference as to what you can actually achieve in that period of time because sometimes you start going and then you go you look at it and you go I mean I'm never gonna get all of this done in three months take some stuff off like prioritize or like sometimes you go oh it's easily achievable maybe now's the time to film a podcast (laughs) because you know what I mean you might find every now and again to me it's more often than not I'm like oh wow I'm never gonna achieve all those things I'm gonna like take some stuff off um but I think for me anyway that's been a really useful practice like quite often like with my leadership team I would like talk to them about doing something similar if they're feeling a bit overwhelmed or they've just got too much stuff to do and then it's like my job to help them with what sits on there from a professional point of view you know you can go out and like ask for help with that stuff or share it um, and I think it's also one of those things if you've got that you might look at it four five six seven weeks into that quarter and go wow I haven't really done any of those things what's going on like yeah. or or um, flying through it it's just a good really good way of keeping yourself on track I mean mm. I think it's brilliant. I think it's a brilliant trait of someone who, who likes to, to achieve and likes mm. to really achieve goals is actually yeah. knowing when something's not achievable mm. and doing something about it rather than, yeah, I'm going to do all of these things and actually not, not doing them, actually knowing how you get success. Um, mm. And there's, there's actually, there's a, a great model, see as you enjoy these. Yeah, um, I love these where to understand somebody's like drivers and motivations and what drives them you've got three three types achievers people who are just motivated by achieving and getting the the result not so interested if everybody gets there with them might be happy to cut people off along the way to get to the result then you've got your affiliators who are not like the achievers they don't mind if they don't achieve the goal they would rather run the marathon in six hours rather than four, as long as everybody finishes and preferably finish together. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all about getting there with the team. Yeah. And the last one is power person, someone who's motivated by gaining and, re- and retaining power. So it's not really about whether you achieve the goal. It's just Thanks. making sure that I man- I'm, I'm in control. I don't lose face. And that's I'm um, I'm um, I'm um, I'm in control. I've got the power. They're the ones to watch. They're they're very you've got to be, you've got to be, <laughs> but they're also super helpful because mm. they will power you through, you know, to get there in some yeah. ways, you know. And they've got this sort of character and charisma that can, if you're an achiever, you might go, I need that power person yeah. in the team because they're going to get this. And they'll help done you in the their way. And the merchandise and what you're doing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So every there, no, there's sort of healthy forms and great forms of all of them. Yeah. And there's unhealthy forms of all of them. Yeah, they, you can, can get an achiever who's, yeah, they're going to do anything to get to the result. You've got to watch out for them too. Yeah. The affiliator who might keep people on that are going to bring the yeah. whole team down. Yeah, because they want to cross the line. Too, and it's, exactly. So um, this is another really bit a good bit of theory. <laughs> That's really useful. What would you, how, how would you describe yourself? Because you might be a blend of. I think I'm mainly an achiever, I'd say. Mm-hmm. If, yeah, I mean, everyone's a bit of a blend, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Different maybe. percentages, maybe a 70, 80% achievement. Yeah, with some affiliator, I'd say. Yeah. But I've, I've probably had to, I would, I've had to work more on the power one of that, I'd say. Like, I've tended to be the type of person who kind of gets my head down, cracks on, and doesn't always like look up to share and like outwardly talk about um Mm. the things like we like you know i or we are doing and that's the bit that i've had to definitely like push myself on over Mm. yeah that's it it's good to be aware of those areas where i catch actually is an area i want to work on and develop on yeah okay so that's that's one one area you've done well we've got another one this next one having a meeting with yourself do you send yourself a calendar and like, yeah, yeah, how does this work? 
So do you know what I think this everyone does this, right? But these are all bits that I've just like picked up from people over the years. Like so that having a meeting with you I was something I picked up from Omnicom University, which is this um, amazing program that Omnicom run. It's taught by Harvard Business School professors. They take you away, they do case study led teaching, but they always give like heaps of like golden nuggets of like tips and tricks along the way. And this one was one um that uh, one of the professors called Nancy Cohen had shared about actually the most important meeting you can have every day is the one that you have with yourself. So um, I do have a meeting with myself. I don't necessarily do it every single day, but I do it most days. And it can be, and actually once you get into the habit of doing it, it can be really quick. But it's the bit where you stop. How do you do it? In the morning. First For me, yeah, yeah. It's like a first thing in the morning, like on the train on the way in, or like that moment where you haven't really like got into stuff yet. You're just like, you you know, you're warming up for the day. Yeah. And I think it's that bit where you think about everything that you've got to do that day, like, and really think about it. Like, think about what, what are you prioritizing? What are the one, two, three things you absolutely have to achieve? Like, so some of it is like that basic kind of time management type techniques, but yeah. I find it really helpful to prioritize. But the other thing about it um, is to really think about not just like what you've got to do, but how you want to show up. Like, how do you want to leave people feeling that day? Like, if you've got a big meeting, what is the impact or the impression that you want to leave on those people in that room, in that pitch, whatever it is? And I think that to me has probably been the more transformative bit. Um, I mean, it's always good to like prioritize your tasks, but I think especially like when you move into leadership positions, like you are role modeling a lot of the time and the way you behave and the way you show up will have a ripple on like the people around you on the wider organization. So that's something that I've found to be really useful is like lit, like thinking through how do I want to show up in that particular meeting forum? Like how do I want to make people think like what do I want to people think or feel like after I've like done that thing yeah. and once you get into the it's like with anything like meditation or anything I suppose isn't it it's once you get into the practice of doing it it like it becomes quicker and it becomes like muscle memory yeah. Um, so yeah that's another for me that's been a really like useful practice sounds like a great practice to yeah. have and mm. again through through the coaching that Charles and myself have done we also incorporate evening reviews as well Ooh. where you kind of this can be done usually Again, that wind up time. So you said you do that one before you get into things. Yeah. After you've done everything, can you settle down to look at, okay, how did that go? How did that meeting go? How was I received? You know, did I get the outcome I wanted? Could I tweak that? You know, that was really effective. Let's do more of that. And then that kind of gives you a close on that day. Yeah. Um, allowing you to then have, you know, clear space in your mind of just yeah. everything is done now. I can rest peacefully. I love that. And I think um, that's, yeah, that's a very useful bit of advice for me because I'm definitely not a massively reflective person. I'm more, like it probably comes from being more of a natural achiever, but like I definitely think forwards more than I think backwards. So I think that, yeah, mm. I'm going to, I'll pick that up. Oh, I'll let you know how I get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> have some lovely restful sleeps. Yeah. The things, you've dealt with everything. Your brain doesn't need to sort of process it overnight. And that's great. A stressful time. Love yeah. That. Lovely. Yeah. Numbers. Very important in the role yeah. you're in. Uh, monthly commercial reporting. Tell yeah. us about the, the metrics you're looking at. What's important? Um, so, like, I guess as a media agency, generally you're tasked with, like, a few key numbers, like, from a from a financial perspective anyway. So there'll be, like, a revenue number and generally, like, some kind of profit number that you're looking at, like, month on month. So those... For us, it's pretty simple that if we're hitting those two, if we're hitting a revenue and a profit figure, everyone's happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think, I think the thing that I've learned was probably when I moved into the MD role that I started to get much more exposure to like a proper P&L. And I think they can seem quite daunting at first. There's normally quite a lot in there. There's a lot of lines in there. I always think that actually mostly in any like in an agency leadership position, you really need to know all of those numbers like someone there'll be someone in your team that needs to know all those numbers but I think just getting really clear and focused on which are the ones that you really need to worry about so when I look at our P&L now my eyes literally just go to the two or three numbers that matter and obviously if that you know if this they're not where they need to be we need to get under the skin of it but yeah I think I think if you're moving into a role where that's all quite new to you I'd definitely try and like get some focused time with your CFO or your finance director to properly, you do need to really understand it before you can zoom out, but like ask all the questions, get under the skin of it, know who does need to know which numbers, but then most importantly, which are the ones that 
you're on the hook for. Mm -hmm. But uh, ultimately, the you know everything ladders up to one or two numbers normally that it, you'll be tasked with delivering. And because in some of the cases that you mentioned, some some another company it might be EBIT that's yeah. the number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just working out what those two or three numbers are important. It just exactly. Helps you focus on. Yeah, like some companies, you've super focused on like salary to revenue ratio or something else. Like, you know, everyone will have like a set of key indicators that are that they're tasked to like report back on. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just about getting really tight to them. And I would I would say it is really important to find like your, you, like in any like agency leadership or leadership position, having an ally, a really strong relationship with your CFO, finance director is really, really key. Yeah. Um uh, so that they will, you know, and you've spent the time getting under the skin of it before you, before you get to that elevator view. Mm. Yeah, I think that's come up. I think that might be the second time that's come up in terms of uh, having a relationship with a CFO in this season, actually. Yeah, it's really important. You know, I also think there's a danger in like some, you know, you don't, the CFO, CFO holds a massively important role and they're, they're, they're a huge partner to a CEO in any role. But, you know, it is a partnership, like, you know, it's not all on their shoulders to make sure that everything adds up. Like you've got to work together as a team and work out how you help, how the decisions you're making are impacting on the PL, like mm. et etc. Cetera, et cetera. So that partnership is super important. Zav, uh, um, Havas said, you know, you've got to know when to disagree with your CFO as well mm -hmm. and know when to be like, okay, my role is the vision here. And you've got to know when you really believe in something. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not so much against the, the advice, but it's sort of taking all it's supposed to take all part all information in and then come up with a solution rather than you know only listen to your cfo only listen to your ceo or whatever i think that's it and i do think that's where like you build up like for me a lot of it is also intuition like a lot of what we do is like obviously it's numbers driven in lots of ways but lots of i think agencies are organisms really they're quite like organic i would say in the way that they grow and they evolve and they develop and i do think a lot of the role of a good ceo of an agency is to like really be able to like feel how that agency is growing and evolving and make some more intuitive decisions as well as the ones that are kind of just numbers based. Mm, yeah. And key meetings, what are the key, how do you sort of structure your year with key meetings that are important as a... So we have like, I guess the year starts before the year begins. So we'll always do like the last quarter of a calendar year is spent like planning for the following year. So we'll do like a, a financial plan and an agency strategy for the following year that then all gets submitted before Christmas. And then, so we will always start the year with a really clear sense of what our strategy is. Like, we'll always make sure that's really well shared with the agency, like, in lots of depth with the board and heads of department. But then we'll make sure that the agency is clear in, like, what's our direction of travel, what we're trying to achieve, uh, what are our clients really looking for, and how do we need to evolve to stay, like, future fit and, ahead, like, ahead of the curve of what, like, we where we see the industry going, where we see client demands going. So making sure that's really clear. But also, I would say, like, it's really important that when you're sharing that, you're thinking about like, what do you want each individual person in the agency? Like we have 450 people. So the, the way that we can have the most impact is if each of those people who are listening to what we're trying to achieve as an agency takes something away that they might do differently, think differently, contribute to as a result of what we're sharing. So I think a lot of that, you know, when you're setting your stall out as an agency, a lot of it is about empowerment. How can you empower people to want to be part of that story? and want to do something differently the next day or the next week or the next month because of your agency strategy. I think sometimes they can, if you're not careful, they can be a bit disconnected. You might be talking at a leadership level about a strategy, a capability, something you're developing. But actually, if you're a, an exec and a team, like, do you actually feel any differently? Are you asked to do anything differently as a result? And if not, then it's not really a strategy that's ever going to yeah. like have an impact or like make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty important. Um, and then we do like... Um, we will always make sure we have like better together days, offsites as an agency. Again, I think that's really important in a world of hybrid working, like those moments where you get everyone together and just the energy of everyone being together, like making connections with each other, like around, you know, that, that doesn't have to be around like a work-based thing, but making sure people have like good quality time spent together, like building those connections is really important. Yeah. And then I'd say like other like key meetings we have in the agency every week, we will get together and face face and do a big agency huddle like there's, there's all like those types of things which i think are important to think through and a when do you do that we do that every tuesday so we had one this morning oh right. really tuesday at 11 every tuesday at 11 every tuesday, tuesday at 11 okay. um and we just do a big huddle in the agencies it's the day that everyone's in everyone gets together um 
some weeks we get like partners in to come and talk to us about what's going on in like whether it's a media partner like ITV or we had Google in this morning talking about some of the great stuff they've got coming down the line and then we'll balance that with you know the things that we're doing in the agency some some of our advisory groups might come in and talk about what they're doing from a DNI point of view or a, uh, we've got a better planet team for example they might come and talk about what they're doing so it's just a real mix of stuff that brings everyone together and like that stuff that that should build up into a broader narrative I guess over the, mm. the weeks and the months but that's that's pretty important to keep everyone connected, I think. Brilliant. Love it. Really, really s- essential. The, the last couple of years have been really successful. So oh. I want to give you full opportunity <laughs> here to no humbleness, tell <laughs> great, <laughs> great successes I've <laughs> had. Yeah, it's your you, time. <laughs> you also, what tracks with that, you said, is your diversity inclusion policies and approach which you feel is is really strongly linked with yeah. your success. So I'd love to explore that with you. Yeah. First, um, I'll yeah. tell you how, how amazing you guys are doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should say it now while it's still true, shouldn't I? But um, yeah, we've had an amazing few years as an agency. The agency is like, it's the biggest it's ever been. Um, we've got, an, like we talked about it at the top of the podcast, we've got an amazing like bunch of clients that we're working with at the moment. We feel very privileged to to work with. Um, we've had a, a, this incredible like new business street. Um, we've like won seven pitches in a row, um, which is like nominal. Um, and you know, we're doing some really exciting work with some really long standing clients. So we've had lots of our clients for a really long time. So like McDonald's we've worked with for 18 years, for example, now like channel four, like I say, I think we're into the 38th year of working with them now. Like we've got some super long standing partnerships with clients. Amazing. And then, you know, we, you know, again, like some, some of the clients that are like I guess we've worked with more recently but clients like Barclays who are now into like the sixth year of working with where you can get to really start to strengthen and build those relationships so there's loads of um really exciting stuff that happening as as an agency we we won so in the media industry there's the media week awards it's like the big like award show of the year and um last year we won media week agency of the year for the first time ever so it's the 13th time we've been shortlisted and the sixth consecutive year we've been shortlisted for it we've won it and it was this thing where we started to scratch our heads just going i just don't even know how to win it like who's ever like, going to win this like thing? dicaprio and an oscar or something yeah, like yeah yeah exactly um and then last year we finally won it so it's this amazing like moment where it all came together but i do think yeah i mean there's loads of things that have contributed to, to that but i i don't think it's any coincidence that we have over the last couple of years like really focused on like diversity inclusion and like psychological safety within the organization like really trying to embed a growth mindset into everyone um within omd and i think all of that has kind of come together alongside a lot of what we've done on strategy structure investment into capabilities that clients are looking for there's loads of stuff that comes together to make it happen but yeah we've done a huge amount of work on like diversity and inclusion over the last couple of years um and i think that always you know some part of that has been about um you know attracting like new like diverse employees into the agency and then obviously there's a load of work that we need to do when those people arrive which is about like making sure that we've got a culture that really promotes belonging where everyone can thrive and the age the profile of the agency has has changed pretty significantly over the last three years or so from and when I talk about diversity I I mean that very broadly I mean that from an ethnicity point of view but also from like sexuality socioeconomic gender we've really looked at like that whole prism of diversity and done everything that we can to to really like mix up the the profile of the agency can you share specifically what let's start with what hasn't worked what have you learned what have you done or what have you not done that you've gone okay that's a learning point we need to do better at that and then we can move on to some things that really worked well so i think um yeah i think like i do think as you go on any um kind of like diversity and inclusion journey like it's not all going to go perfectly well like you have to accept that there's going to be you've got to like stuff will go wrong and the most important thing is you've got to understand like why isn't that working and what do we need to do differently and if you're really trying to like change the the profile and the shape of an agency it's going to take time so I'd say a good example of that is like one of the things we've been doing is working with a lot of new um apprenticeship providers for example to bring in people like early talent like at apprentice level so people who haven't gone to universities they're like they're young people right Mm. and um 
like we've been using lots of providers who like very deliberately go out there and get people from a very diverse set of backgrounds and quite often in that we've been like from a socioeconomic point of view we've been bringing in people into the agency that you know have got quite a different background potentially to the people we've worked with before and actually what we found was we were seeing quite a lot of churn of those people so, so you know that means they would leave yeah you. so in some cases you know over a we might be losing like 25 percent of the people that we you know been hiring at that early talent level a year later and we were kind of like this is like doesn't feel right like what are we doing and actually what we're doing now um which uh, we're we're literally about to launch it so i'd have to come back at another time and talk to you about like the impact of it but it's what we're doing is um developing a new early talent program early talent program which is actually we've developed that with apprentices who've 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 just come through so these are the people who've just come off the apprenticeship scheme they've just graduated and with their support we're actually developing it and actually um there was a group of them that actually came to us as a board in the first instance and went we've got some thoughts on this like (laughs) you guys don't know all the answers (laughs) we need to come and tell you about a few things and like what so it's actually working collaboration with them um i feel like you would have been one of those people to be like yeah i'll tell you what needs to change (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm going to be CEO here one day, so I might as well get... I've got loads of those. It's great. I'm like, come and talk to me. This is excellent. I want to know. But, you know, it's things like, so, for example, um, you know, I think it's really important to try and understand when you're bringing in people, like, say, so, for example, some of the people that we're bringing in at a very, like, early level, they might have come from a background where they have not got parents who've had an office job before. So then some of the stuff that if you've had parents who've had an office job, you've probably just by osmosis absorbed certain things that... Some of these people coming in might not have done. So literally some of the stuff that we're putting in place is like, um, you know, like how to write a good email, how to like how to show up in a meeting, like how, you know, you know, office etiquette type stuff. And that's not in a like condescending way. It's just a practical, like here's some things that you need to think about. And then some of it is like uh, about personal branding and like some of it is about like just foundational stuff that is just going to help them kind of get on in their careers. But none of it is because they get the core media training when they come in anyway. And that's why we were scratching our heads a bit because we were like, we've got this great program and they've obviously got the apprenticeship providers giving them some stuff. We're giving them media training. But really, this program is actually much more about the soft skills and, and um, building a community around them. So the graduated apprentices are, are like helping run that community with the new apprentices coming in so that we can keep it evolving and growing. And I think that's just not something we would have done a few years ago. We had a graduate program, but it look, would have looked very different to... Mm. Uh, you know this more pastoral support i suppose that we're putting around those I mean, apprentices again that's your tote in that area as you test this yeah the brought graduates in yeah okay operate something's not working here yeah 25 percent are going do something new and test again you're in that sort of yeah. next phase now of testing again seeing yeah. how this new approach works which is really and then i think the important thing is that is that like you can't like don't give up on it like you can't just go this isn't working apprentices mm-hmm. are not working for us like you know we're having a few performance issues here and we're having churn issues here like you've got to go well, why isn't it working like what needs to change like because if you're got, if your mission is strong enough and you know where you're trying to get to can't give up on it you've just got to try and find a different way to make it work i see it and within that within that journey you then evolve what you're doing to something that's more effective yeah and you and you're learning like as well like you're learning we're learning from you know the, the people who are developing those programs they're coming in and teaching us the board because like some of that stuff like we were we we wouldn't have been able to build that program because we you know we could have asked and we could have got maybe somewhere a bit close to it but the power comes from i think creating an environment where those people feel empowered to say hey there's a better way to do this and, and we want to help like you know the, the, i think that generation coming through they're super inspiring they'll put their hands up and they'll lean in and want to do something about it mm-hmm. Um, which is great. So I think it's about like harnessing that and help using them to help us create that like, you know, better, more equitable entry point, I suppose, for the next set of um, mm. businesses coming through. So yeah, watch this space. I'm sure it'll be a great, great success. And and even if it isn't, you will do something about Oops. it, not give up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Test again. Test and then again. you exit when it works. Yeah, exactly. Um, now tell us about a real success story. I think, yeah, there's one with, with Toby. Toby. Yeah. And it's and I'm it. sure others as well, where you 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 kind of looked outside the industry. How has that really worked for you? Well, yeah, look, I think because I think part of and this actually this is something else that I'd say has not yet worked as well as we'd like it to. Is inevitably we have 
like other, like I say, the profile of our agencies changed massively over the last few years, but it's changed very quickly at a junior level and it's changed far more slowly at a senior level, um, partly just because, partly because of, you have less hiring opportunities at a senior level, but partly because obviously we operate in an industry that also has a representation issue at a senior level. So it's, you know, when we're looking at talent pipelines for more senior roles, you tend to find people of a, like a very kind of like middle class, straight white profile tends to be what you find. So I think one of the things that we've done um, really successfully actually so far is like look in certain roles, look to adjacent industries where we can find talent with like transferable skills and bring them in. Yeah. So one great example is like Toby Sare who came, um, she actually used to work in financial services um, in growth roles. Um, and we contacted her um, like when we had a business development role come up. So she came over about two years ago now um, and had to learn the world of media, which I think is like when you come in, she was like, well, like mm -hmm. there's a lot of acronyms. <laughs> there's yeah, a lot yeah. to learn. The thing is, though, she understood about a lot. Everything that we wanted in that role was about someone who's got that eye for growth, who can like understand like, you know, how to create incredible um, kind of pitch narratives and like, you know, sell to prospective clients, which she's amazing at. She's brilliant at marketing. She actually has her own like whole side hustle thing. I mean, you should definitely get she's her on this book. podcast. She's written a book. Like she's incredible. You should get her to come on this podcast too. Um, so, you know, she had loads of transferable skills and she's flown in that role. Like she's come in and she's brought real fresh eyes, fresh thinking, um, like completely different perspective on stuff. And, you know, like, yeah, she, since she's come in, like that's when this incredible, like, you know, pitch winning like success tree she's been a huge part of that like a huge part of like really helping us mix up the way that we pitch like thinking really inclusively about how we pitch this she's introduced things like a like a like a guide she, it's like called a personal guide to pitching so at the start of any pitch process people fill in this like a guide to me and it talks about how to get the best out of me in this pitch process if you've got outside of work commitments whack them down like tell us when also that when do you work best are you a early bird a night owl are you like if you have to, if you if you work three and a half days a week, put it down on there and we'll try and work out a way. Like, you know, it's all that stuff where really early and upfront, you can kind of have a look at that and go, right, how do we, how do we pitch in a way that doesn't mean that everyone has to put like their lives on pause at the same time? So bringing in new thinking like that, right, it's been great. Um, Was there an element, do you have to, if you're bringing someone from another industry, do you have to put them through some sort of training to sort of help them transition to a new industry? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like, I mean, of course, it's more of a, like, there's more of an investment in that person from a time perspective. So, like, you know, Toby just more like our foundational media, like, stuff just to kind of get up to speed. And then I think it, anyone in coming into that, into a role from an adjacent industry, like, obviously, they need to be super curious as well, because we can give, like, media training. But it's also been about, like, like, Toby asking the right questions and making sure that she's using those, like, pitch experiences to go, but how about that? And actually, I want to follow up with you on this. And actually, our, new, um, our head of people who's been with us for a year, again, she came in from an adjacent industry and she's just doing brilliantly well. And like, you know, I think I, I think it's something that as an industry, we just need to start doing more. Like we talk a lot about it, but we need to start like, you know, putting the actions Absolutely. in place of the words in lots of cases. And I mean, right now for you, it's like a competitive advantage as, yeah. as not others are doing that. You're yeah. going to, you know, um, recruit amazing people from adjacent industries and yeah, like, probably find ways course it's and I do but I mean and I will always say this like we are not like we are way off perfect like you know we've got loads more to do mm -hmm. um but I think by bringing those people in and you know you've got to start somewhere and then you grow from there um so yeah it's and it's 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 been a it's been a really interesting like experience like kind of culturally like thinking about how we how we evolve our agency culture to make sure that you know, people from all different walks of life feel like they belong is fascinating. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it can at times feel really like demoralizing, but you've got to keep on like focus on, I guess, where you're trying to get to with it all. Mm -hmm. See, so, yeah, I think that's been a good journey for us. And that's definitely our ethos mm -hmm. about unifying, coming together. You know, we, we run our unified creative roundtables mm -hmm. and bring leaders together. We're definitely about sharing knowledge, sharing what works because. You know, it is true as if the industry can sort of rise together, mm. it is beneficial for all in the long term. It's not about keeping secrets and um, and just trying to, you know, make it work for yourself. Yeah. And I think like as an industry, like we are, we have a responsibility to reflect the people that we're trying to reach and talk to. And, yeah. you know, that is very actually like very infrequently 
matches the exact profile of the people that often we have inside the agency. So we literally this morning, actually, we did our, we have a, a research series called the Real Britain series. And this morning's piece of research was on, we're, call, we're calling it Growing Old Disgracefully, but it's on um, the over 55s. And it's just fascinating, right? You go, there's like, I think it's like 6% of people in our, in advertising media are over 55. And yet 32% of the population is over 55. They hold 60% of the nation's wealth. Well, and yet, like, you know, we, you know, it, and that doesn't mean that because you don't, you're not that person, you can't think about how to influence them. But it does mean that we need to do, work harder to really understand them and not just think about them as some homogenized, like, group of people. And I think that's been the interesting thing when you bring different people in who represent different, like, parts of our society. You get this really beautiful fabric of stuff coming together and, like, you know, different opinions, different experiences will help us do better work for our clients. And that's ultimately the, you know, the end goal. Yeah. Well, that is the story of how you became CEO of OMD UK, 16 years in the making. What a cool story. So we will, um, we will end with a poem. I'll do a little summary first. <laughs> you I think the, the lessons from your life are um, for someone, yeah, looking back and, and who's ambitious as well i think you've done yeah really well to just have that undeniable like focus on what you wanted to achieve from entering the company <laughs> which i think is so cool and then that's that's the easy bit in a way to go i want to be a millionaire mm. i'm not a millionaire by the way <laughs> for the record <laughs> but those sort of like typical big goals that people set you know and it's not about that it's about okay set your goal and then what do you do about it and you consistently over the years over the years over the years has had this focus of getting to your goal and you've done something about it day after day and some days you have a rubbish day you know and yeah. some days you just don't want to do anything and some days you have great days but it's that consistency over days weeks months and years and you're proof that you can get there yeah. with that level of focus and you've made mistakes and things have gone wrong and you've got the job and you thought, actually, I don't know if I can do this, <laughs> you know, <Actually. laughs> um, but you persevered again. Yeah. And I think that's a massive lesson from your life people can take of just having that undeniable focus and consistency to work towards those goals and make, let people know, speak it out. Speak and out. Um, you've got a much more chance of, of it happening. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure. definitely. Truth. Being truthful in your intentions means that everyone knows, everyone's informed, and you can keep on moving forward. 100%, yeah. So here's your, your second poem. I create this one out of what you've said and what we've taken. So he's written this what, while we've... Yeah, no, we've been writing this while, while we've been uh, going. So <clears throat> you can discover that you can really be successful without being the loudest person in the room. And in morning and night, it's helpful to remember your reviews. To be clear with your intentions can help you better your position, even if it's telling the CEO you want their job. Now that's some bold ambition. <laughs> you can get to where you want if you follow your own pace. Take stock of all the benefits and put forward your best case. If you are ever under pressure, take a breath and give it some time. And with that, you can stretch up and grow and let your authentic self shine. I love that. I can't believe you can just write that live out of what someone's saying to you. That's amazing. Been a lyricist for a very long time. Yeah, well done. Great cool. skill. Thank you so much. And that's for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Pleasure. Loved you it. Enjoyed it. I really loved it. I wasn't sure about doing it to be honest, but um, I you, loved it. Glad you did now. Yeah, I'm really glad. Of Any final words? I mean, I don't even know how I can follow that poem. So I think you know, I'm not going to try and better that. Um. Yeah, I'm just, I do think what you said is right, though. I think believe in yourself and focus and anything is possible bit by bit. It's very true. Yeah. And that is how you became okay. CEO of OMD UK. 